evening, everyone. Thank you all for coming out tonight. It's lovely to see so many of you here. My name is Beth, and I am new with the See and Learn team. Um, first of all, tonight I want to thank the sponsor for our live stream. That's Carib Trans. They're making this lecture tonight and every night available through our Facebook live stream. So we are appreciative of that support. I should also thank El Momo Cottages, who are sponsoring tonight's presenter. So that's a huge benefit and makes see and learn possible. We really appreciate their support. And also the Prince Bernhard Culture Funds and public entity SEBA who support all of see and learn um, throughout the month. So they make all of the activities that we do, the field projects, the activities with the schools and the senior center and all of these evening lectures a possibility. And we actually have, in addition to those major sponsors, over 50 community sponsors that make CN Learn possible. So we do want to acknowledge all of their support as well. Now, for the next couple of days, just a couple of things that you guys should know about upcoming. So tomorrow night, we have a night dive with Paul Sickle, who's doing our presentation tonight. Come out and do a cool night dive with us where we're going to be collecting and observing some of the marine parasites that he's going to be talking about. Then on Wednesday, there's a snorkel opportunity in the evening or in the afternoon at 1 p.m. You can go out and snorkel with Dr. Ian Hewson, who will then be doing the presentation Wednesday night at Eco Lodge on the diadema die-off, which has been happening all around the region and globally, and it's really important. It's super super interesting research that also pairs really well with Paul's research. So do come by, visit us at the See and Learn tent and learn more. If you participate in any of our field activities, you get a really cool See and Learn shirt that you've seen scattered throughout the crowd and people wearing them around the island. So just another reason to come take part. You can rep the brand and everything is made with recycled plastic. You may have also noticed behind me and over in the corner and in lots of people's hands. Let's see, raise a glass. Are you drinking a Save a Cloud Top right now? Yes, excellent. So feel on top of the world with Save a Cloud Top that does support See and Learn. I should mention before we move on to tonight's speaker that we also have amazing raffle prizes. So please do buy some raffle tickets if you haven't. We've got some really cool things available as part of the raffle and they are only $5 per raffle ticket. So stop by and see us, buy one, buy five, buy an arm's length of raffle tickets. So for tonight, we do have Paul Sickle here who's speaking on exposing the hidden majority, the ecology of host parasite interactions in coral reef ecosystems. So Paul was actually last here about 10 years ago as one of our see and learn experts. And this year we decided to bring him back as part of our 20th anniversary excitement. Paul is a research professor at the University of Miami's Rosenstiel School of Marine, Atmospheric, and Earth Sciences in the Department of Marine Biology and Ecology. His current research focuses on the ecology of host parasite interactions in coral reef systems. Paul's work has appeared in a bunch of different media outlets, including National Geographic, both film and print. The BBC, including Blue Planet 2, which is very cool. National Public Radio and Channel 1 News, which is a national news program for high school students who's so reaching audiences of all ages. Unlike the topic, parasites, Paul's presentation tonight will definitely not suck. So let's find out together <laughs> by welcoming back our tie-dye loving Paul Sickle. All right. Thanks, Beth. Thanks so, so much. Uh, thanks to See and Learn for, uh, for having us back. I'm really shocked that they would have us back, but uh, we'll take what I can get. We really appreciate it. And also to El Momo for both putting us up and putting up with us. Uh, all right. So, if I were to take you on a little diving adventure on any coral reef in the world and ask you to give me your perspective on biodiversity, you would probably say, oh, there's a lot of cool fish there, or lots of corals, or maybe you're into macro, and so you'd point out all the, you know, the invertebrates that you can photograph. Uh, so you'd focus on things that you can see. 
that's natural where, you know, terrestrial primates were lucky to be able to go underwater at all. But if you look at each one of the things in this picture, and I'll focus on the fishes for now, but it applies equally to everything else, what you see are lots of little things that are living on and inside those. And so these are parasites. So everything in that picture has multiple species of parasites that live on it, some of them unique to that species. Uh, and even the parasites, some of them have parasites. So you can get a, a sense of how quickly the biodiversity of those organisms ramps up. It just it boggles the mind. And yet, because we're, you know, we, at the scale of our, our vision, we don't, we don't see them uh, unless we look specifically for them. Also, if I were to ask you for your perspective on trophic interactions in, in the ocean, those are the interactions that involve the transfer of energy, uh, so what eats what? You'd say, well, yeah, big fish eat smaller fish, and those fish eat even smaller fish, and so on. But also, on the right, uh, little things can eat big things. They just do it a little bit at a time, so it goes unnoticed. All right. So uh, my focus of, of, of our research is on parasite uh, host interactions, and it didn't start off that way. I'll, I'll explain how we backed into that. But be, uh, in, in writing grant proposals and getting our research published, we have to justify our existence. Like, why do we, why, why should anybody care about this stuff? So I'm going to tell you uh, what kind of things that we, we point out as um, important uh, aspects of, of these organisms and why uh, they should support our research. So first of all, Parasite, parasitism is the most popular biological profession. So all organisms have to obtain energy somehow. And the most common way of obtaining energy in the wild turns out to be parasitism, more than any other way of obtaining energy. Uh, it's globally, uh, roughly half of all organisms make their living via parasitism. But in high diversity places like coral reefs, it's as much as 80%. So, you know, mind boggling. All right, so if you do a Google search, um, if you type in food web, you probably remember this from elementary or high school, food web, and you have these complex diagrams with all these arrows of what's eating what. So you try and do that search, you'll see hundreds of these diagrams for all kinds of systems, open ocean, forests, deserts, mountains, whatever, but you won't see parasites in any of them. And yet everything in that picture that you see is culture. So you start adding Uh, when you start adding the parasites into that picture, it completely changes the picture. All right, as you know, uh, parasites can cause or facilitate diseases, and therefore they can impact population dynamics of their hosts. That's important. They can influence behavior and how organisms utilize habitat. They can mediate other kinds of symbiotic interactions like cleaning symbiosis. They can mediate species invasions. They can influence whether or not an introduced species can become a successful invader. They can be used as indicators of habitat quality and the effects of humans on the environment. And they can be used to identify the source populations of hosts. So you can, by taking the parasites off of a host, figure out where it came from. So all the things in white are things that we do, our lab does. We, we haven't gotten into the yellow one yet, but everything else uh, we do. All right, so how does this all begin? So the, the most frequent question asked after, I, after they, people ask me, uh, what do you do? They say, well, you know, why do you do that? And how did you get into that? And so the story is this. I was originally trained as a, as a behavioral ecologist. My focus is on reproductive behavior in fish, uh, particularly damselfish. And in the Caribbean and elsewhere in the tropics, the, the damselfish spawn at dawn. So like at first light, as soon as a little bit of light, they, they start. And by half an hour past sunrise, it's all done. You've missed it. And so I spent months every day watching uh, these fish. In this case, it's a yellowtail damselfish spawning at dawn. All right, how about here? Sp spawning at, at dawn. And um, so the problem they face is that the, the female has to go to the male's nest to spawn. She then has to leave her territory to do that. She has her own territory that has resources in it like food. She has to leave home to go to his place to spawn, leaving her place exposed. And so um, there's a trade-off there between spawning and territory defense. 
And what I noticed is that the females were interrupting spawning to visit cleaning stations near the male's territory. It's like, why are you like adding time to your time away from your territory? Why don't you just do the cleaning later? You know, why don't you just do spawning and then later get cleaned? So whatever it was that was causing them to go to the cleaner fish must be pretty important. And so here's a female um, getting cleaned by a, a cleaner goby. And so this story uh, was, um, was uh, told through in, a, in a film called Ripple, uh, which was uh, produced by uh, Jennifer Berglund. Those deadheads in the, crown, in the crowd will, will get the reference. So you can do a Google sh search of, um, of Vimeo uh, Ripple, and you'll see that uh, film. It's about a 12-minute film. All right, so, so the, the, these fish are getting cleaned at dawn. And so what are the cleaner fish eating from them? That's probably the key to figuring out why this is happening, is that whatever the cleaner fish are picking off of them is probably what's driving them to do this. So what do cleaner fish eat? Well, if you cut open a cleaner goby in the Caribbean or a cleaner wrasse in the Pacific, they're full of these things called nathed or nathed isopods. These are, and there's like popcorn. They're just full of these things, hundreds of them in their, in their gut, depending on how big the, fit, the cleaner is. So this is their primary prey item these little isopods that they're picking off the fish. That red you see in there is blood from the fish that that thing fed on. This is obviously not to scale. Um, these things are like one to two millimeters long. Yeah, but so these cleaner fish are eating these little isopods. So, hmm, all right, so when are these isopods active? Get to that next. So if you look at cleaning activity on a coral reef, then these are for a, another kind of damsel fish. You'll see on the left, there's a, there's a peak at dawn. So if you follow a fish throughout the day and look at when it's interacting with a cleaner, dawn is the peak. And it's like the first, you know, first hour of sunlight. If you're in the water after that, what you see is that big drop off down on the right. So during the, from maybe like 6.30 until maybe three or four in the afternoon, it's pretty low. And then at dusk, it starts to pick up again, but nowhere near what it is at dawn. Like dawn is, is by far the peak. So, the, so dawn is like the peak cleaning time for these fish. All right, so this is the title of the presentation and here are our social media handles. If you care to follow us. Let's first do a, a quick review on symbiosis since we're talking about parasitism, which is the type of symbiosis. Let's, can, let's uh, um, do a review so that we uh, know how parasitism compares to other, other types of symbiosis. So commensalism is where both parties, well, one party benefits and the other party, no big deal. Whatever. So no harm. Mutualism is where both parties have a, a positive outcome. That is, the interaction benefits both parties. And parasitism is where one party benefits at the expense of the other. That is, one in, in, um, in engaging in the interaction, some, one thing benefits and the other thing experiences a cost. Now, if you want to get <coughs> <a> technical, <coughs> mostly about the last one, but the second one is actually to come in uh, as well. All right, most uh, parasites are what are called cryptofauna. These are tiny organisms, organisms that you don't see they're hidden, uh, but, but they're, they're an exception, right? So some parasites, parasites are actually big, big like lampreys. All right, so uh, let me talk a little bit about the life cycle of these uh, gnathid isopods. They're unusual even among parasites in that only the juvenile stages feed, and there are three juvenile th stages, and each one feeds on a single host. It feeds on a single fish. It then uh, digests that blood meal, metamorphoses to the second stage, feeds again, digests that blood meal, goes to the third stage, feeds again. After the third feeding, and there's some blood-fed ones, after the third feeding, it becomes an adult, either a male, lower left, or a female lower right. So only the uh, juvenile stages feed, the adult stages don't feed at all, they just reproduce and they die. But the taxonomy is all based on the male specimens. So you to, to use the taxonomy to identify the species, you have to rear them up to get males. All right, so just like ticks and mosquitoes, they spend most of their time not on the host. They attach the host just long enough to get a blood meal, then they fall off and they go back in the substrate. And so the substrate has a lot to do with where they can live, what places are good for them or not so good uh, for them. So they spend about 90% of their life 
not on the hose. They just hit and run, take their blood meal off, and uh, hang out in the substrate. So naphids are just like ticks and mosquitoes. We call them the ticks or mosquitoes of the sea. Just like ticks and mosquitoes, they feed on blood of their host, in this case fishes, and they don't stay on the host very long, just long enough to feed, then they, then they uh, either fly away or drop off. All right, so when are these things active? Well, if you look at the uh, left uh, green arrow, that's dawn, and then the right uh, green arrow is midnight, and so you see that there's basically two peaks. As the day goes on and it gets to dusk, you start to see an increase, and that peaks around midnight, and then a little bit of a decline, and then another spike at dawn. So you can imagine a fish that's going to sleep at night, you know, right around dusk, it's getting hit with that midnight peak, and then when it wakes up in the morning, it's getting hit with a dawn peak. So it wakes up with like all these things on it from the night. <coughs> and so you can see why they want to go a cleaner and get them removed, uh, even if they should be spawning or guarding their territory. This, this seems pretty important. If you look elsewhere in the world, this is the Philippines, uh, you see the same pattern. In Australia, you see the same pattern. So it seems to be a global pattern that these things are most active uh, between dusk and dawn. All right, what's also cool about this is that there's a, a difference in the sizes of naphids that are strongly nocturnal and those that are active uh, more around the dawn and dusk period. The bigger they are, the more strongly nocturnal they are. I wonder why that uh, happened that way. That's weird. Uh, anyway, so the bigger they are, the uh, more strongly nocturnal they are. So you, you, you almost never catch a small one around midnight, and you almost never catch a really big one uh, in dawn and dusk. And this happens around the world where we look. But what's cool about it is in the Caribbean, this happens within species. This is the same species that as it gets older and develops, it becomes more and more nocturnal. Whereas in places like Australia, you have some more diurnal species and some more nocturnal species. Grunts and snappers is that at nighttime, they split, they leave the reef. They go out in seagrass beds or sand flats and feed, but they're, they're off. Um, so, so overall, nocturnal fish are more susceptible, but nocturnal fish that stay on the reef at night, they're pretty resistant. Nocturnal fish that leave the reef at night um, are very susceptible. And that has consequences. So grunts and snapper, mostly grunts, um, are probably the most studied uh, fish in the Caribbean. A lot of work has been done on their migrations. At, at dusk, they migrate out to the seagrass bed or the sand flats. And then at dawn, they come back to the exact same place. You can go there every day and watch a, a group of grunts take their migration out, come back in. This is also uh, shown in Ripple if you want to have a look at that. Nice video of that. Um, so the hypotheses for why that happens is one, they get more food in the seagrass beds, or two, they reduce their risk of predation. But from what we've shown about how susceptible they are to parasites, um, this is another possibility. The third one is that they're basically leaving the hotbeds of the parasites um, in a way it's, that reduces their, their exposure. So this is an experiment we did. Um, if you look at the uh, two bars on the left, those are fish that we uh, put out at night or dusk and picked up at dawn. On the left is reef, and on the right, seagrass bed where they want to be. The reef is where they don't want to be. And then on the uh, right ones is, is a, a much shorter set, which we said it does can pick up around midnight. So in both cases, you see that you get a lot more, you get a lot more parasites on them if you make them stay on the reef than if you let them go in the seagrass beds where they want to be. It's a huge difference. But what's Equally important is that while they reduce their exposure to the parasites, they don't eliminate it entirely. And this has consequences because as they're leaving the reef at dusk, they get some on them and they transport them out and they fall off in the seagrass bed where they can then infect other fish. Then when they come back in the morning, they come back just after the, uh, the dawn peak. They dodge that peak and they get it on their way down, but they still get something. And so they, f f by that, they can effectively transfer energy from the seagrass bed to the reef because the parasites feed on them and then drop off on the reef. So they're transferring, it, they're transferring, they're trafficking navids to the seagrass bed and they're transferring energy from seagrass to reef by navids that feed on them once they get back. 
So that's all. This is a part of uh, Gina Hendricks. Uh, Gina Hendricks is uh, my PhD student uh, back there. Uh, this is part of her, her PhD uh, work. So what you can see here is you have this whole you have this whole network of grunts on different reefs all meeting in the same seagrass bed, and then Nathan said have been transferred by one grunt may later be picked up by another and transferred to another reef. So you get all this mixing of these parasites through this grunt migration, which is pretty cool. All right, what's another twist of this story is that most of you uh, who've uh, been diving for any length of time at all have seen these big isopods on the, like on the face of that fish, right? So those are more, when you know, we mentioned we work on parasitic isopods, most people think of we're working on those. We do some work on those. Um, and so they're much bigger than the natives and they stay on the fish for about a year. Turns out that fish that have those big parasites on them rarely make the migration. They tend to stay put, whereas the ones that don't have that parasite on them consistently go out. So the ones that have the parasite tend to stay, stay back, this, this big uh, Antilocra isopod. All right, let's talk about effects of, uh, of nathids on, on settlement stage coral reef fish. So coral reef fish, as you, as you may know, spin um, their larval stage in the plank to plank to plank to plank. They're hatched from eggs that are laid on the bottom or they're, the eggs are broadcast in the water column. Either way, the larvae end up in the water column and taken away by the currents. And then at some point, roughly a month from when they're, when they're, um, when they're hatched in, 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 the, in the water column, they come back to the reef and, and they, they settle out. And they uniformly settle at night. And that has the benefit of avoiding all the plankton borders that are active in the daytime. They can easily pick them off as they're settling on the reef. But we now know that there's other things that are very active at night that could actually um, do them in. And so these are natives that are attached to settlement stage fish. And you know, depending on the size of the fish and the size of the native, it can take as few as one native to kill a settlement stage fish. So they can have direct impacts through mortality of these, of these little fish. And even if they don't kill it, they can have impacts. So this is a heat map of two little damselfish that were placed in an arena. And you know, damselfish don't like each other, they fight. And so we put a little chamber in the middle of that bowl. That's like the shelter bowl that they both want. And some were infected with, uh, with, with a single nathid, and others were um, not infected. And so these are ones that survived the, the, the infection or the, the, the bite by the nathid. But even if they survived, if you look at the heat map of the uninfected one, it's basically bogarting that middle section. It owns that. Whereas the one that's infected is way out here on the edge. Like it can't get close to that sweet spot. So even if it doesn't die, it, it loses out in competition for shelter spaces, which is very important in preventing uh, predation, because those little fish need to hide from, from big fish that eat them. All right, so as I mentioned earlier, uh, just like ticks and mosquitoes transmit bloodborne parasites, there's good evidence that nathids do as well, uh, particularly um, uh, AP complexin parasites, protozoans that are related to malaria, right? So some native species, not all of them, uh, are, have been shown to transmit uh, these AP complex and blood parasites. All right, so we've shown what, uh, what, how, how these, these parasites can impact the host. There's a variety of ways they can have negative impacts on the host. But if there's only a few of them out there, it's not a big deal. Really, it's just a nuisance, no big deal. So really, the, the degree to which they impact their host depends on how many of them are, there are. And so what determines that? Right? That's an important question. So we know that cleaner fish eat nathids. That's how we got into this in the first place, right? Is by looking at cleaner interactions at dawn on damselfish. So, th so they eat those things, but they only eat them during the daytime. They're not active at night. So what about the nathids that are active at night, which is actually the majority? So uh, nocturnal planktivores like squirrelfish, yeah, they'll eat, they'll eat some. But really, the, the, the really uh, evil predator of these things is live coral. So if you put a nathid anywhere near the polyp of a live coral, 
it, gets, it sucks it in and eats it because natives are effectively zooplankton. When they're looking for hosts swimming around, they're effectively zooplankton. And so corals can, can nab them. And so we have video of uh, coral eating these things. You can see the native gravity be sucked in, just like the Wicked Witch of the... Which one is that? East or West? I always get confused. Yeah. 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 She melts. So, uh, yeah. yeah, so coral is a, a huge predator on these things. So you're probably thinking, hmm, coral predator, corals used to be abundant, but they're not so much anymore. What's going to happen with the native populations? So if you um, do experiments where you set fish, these are the fish inside this tube, and the natives are actually attracted to the host by smell. They can smell the fish in there. You put a tube on a uh, live hard coral, you get very little. You put a tube on, on a dead coral head but still intact, you get more. And if you put a tube on rubble where the coral is totally degraded, you get a lot. So the more degraded the coral, the more natives you get. And so wherever we've looked, and no matter what trapping a technique we've used, we found the same result. That is high coral cover, low nated abundance. Low coral cover, high nated abundance. It's very consistent, very strong pattern wherever we go. All right, I'm gonna switch gears now and talk about the, the role of parasites in influencing whether or not an introduced species can become an invader. So you may know that not all introduced species become successful invaders, right? They could be introduced somewhere, but the situation's not right, so they don't proliferate. But others are introduced, and they go crazy, right? They, they, their populations boom. And one of the most infamous invasive species in the Caribbean is lionfish, right? Everyone knows about that. So this is a, um, a collecting trip in the Bahamas on a single dive in the Bahamas. This is the foot of my... PhD advisor, uh, Mark Hickson, um, after, long after he was my advisor, we were collaborating on a project. And so this is one of three coolers we have on this boat. A single dive with two people, that's how many lionfish we caught. When I went to the Philippines and Guam, where these things are native, it took me, I spent a month in Guam and I, I got no more than 16, the whole month, tr you know, wor working every day to find them. In the Philippines, I managed to get 30, but it took me over a month to get my 30. This is my permit um, allowed. So they're far less common where they are native than where they invaded. That's the trademark of an invasive species. So what is it that allows them to become so successful? Well, there are a variety of factors, but parasites can be one of them. This is a complex diagram showing all the different ways that parasites can influence um, whether or not an species is invasive. And one of the ways is that an invasive species may leave behind the parasites that infect it at home, and when it gets to its new place, those parasites don't recognize it because they're not, they haven't evolved with it, so it's like, who are you, you know? Get out of here, I, I don't want to invade you. So they leave them alone, and yet they still impact the local hosts. And so if you think of parasitism as a tax, that means that the introduced species can be essentially tax-free or much tax-reduced compared to the local species and therefore have a, an advantage in terms of growth and reproduction. So that's what we, we looked at. So this, these graphs show are, are comparing lionfish with other fish that are in a similar uh, trophic guild, that is, they eat similar things, other kinds of predatory fishes like small groupers, snappers, uh, grunts, things like that, things that have similar. Uh, most recent projects is looking at the biodiversity of, of two groups of parasites, the nathan isopods, which we, we talked about a lot today, and also the AP complexins, which at least some of these nathans transmit. So I'll tell you that we're sampling throughout the Caribbean and Philippines, South Africa, Australia, Wherever we go, even within the Caribbean, different islands, we find different species of these things that have no name. They're not described. Nobody knows what they're called. Like, they don't, yeah. So they're brand new to science. So that's kind of mind-boggling. You wouldn't think about, like, going to different islands and seeing new species of, species of fish, right? It's like the same ones throughout the Caribbean. But every island we go to, we find different, different nathans. Uh, and then the blood parasites are even more mind-boggling because when you start looking at, the, at their taxonomic affiliation, you quickly realize 
there's no place for them. Like they don't even fit well into any of the known families of AP complexans. And so they're probably an entirely new family, which is mind boggling. It's, you know, finding a new species, you know, that's, it's not that common. Um, finding a new genus is pretty rare, but a new family, family is just like mind boggling. And so we're, look, we're really looking at things that are, are virtually unknown. And so we're, we're characterizing the biodiversity of these, these organisms. And so our collecting efforts here this week are targeted toward these things, the nathids, which we catch by a variety of means. Uh, one of them are light traps. We can use immersion traps. We can put fish in cages and put them on the reef and pull them up at dawn. Um, we can uh, take chunks of, of the rubble and put it in fresh water and flushes them out. So we have a variety of ways we can, we can work depending on the location and what's feasible. All right, so one of the things we get to do is when we find and discover new species, we get to name them. That's the beauty of, of um, working on things that uh, are, are diverse and what, that nobody else is working on. So um, we've, uh, we've got about 50 undescribed species in our, in our catalog. And it takes about a year to get through, a, to work up a complete description. By the time you do all the drawings, the molecular characterization, everything, it takes a long time. So we got a huge backlog of, of that. And it's getting worse with reflecting more samples. But we love the arts. We appreciate <laughs> what the arts can do for science. We appreciate the ability of artists to connect with the public. Um, and so, um, and we're, you know, we're music junkies. Um, we love Bob Marley and the Whalers and, uh, you know, other, a lot of other, other musicians. And so the first one that we described from the Caribbean uh, was Nathia Marleyi, which we named after Bob Marley. And the most recent one, which the, the paper just came out in June of this year. Oh, I'm sorry, let me backtrack. Um, so through the naming of Nathia Marleyi, I met the bass player for Steel Pulse. Uh, in a hotel lobby in St. Martin about 10 years ago. He had heard a bit that some guy had, had named a, a species after Bob Marley and he, he wanted to meet him and somebody else there uh, told him that that guy was gonna be showing up there tonight. So, um, so we met in the lobby and we had a long conversation. He filmed it, that, that conversation's actually online. You can, you can find it online, the whole conversation. Um, and so we became friends and so uh, Unlock Tafari is his name, uh, plays bass for Steel Pulse. Yeah, oh, backtrack. Uh, we've inspired other artists. So this one on the left is a shirt that's made by an artist on St. John named Sloop Jones. It's our Nathia Marley uh, shirt. And then we have uh, people who've uh, painted Nathia Marley Eye. So a lot of interest among artists. Uh, the most recent one that we named uh, in, in June was after Jimmy Buffett. Uh, and he, before he passed, uh, he knew about this. He, he heard about it and his comment was, it has a nice ring to it. So, um, yeah, we feel fortunate that he knew about it. Uh, very sad, though, that he didn't stick around to uh, really uh, appreciate it and enjoy it. So uh, that's our most recent um, Nathan paper. All right, now I'm going to switch gears and go back to our roots. How we got into parasites was by watching cleaner fish clean fish at dawn. Now we're going back to cleaner fish and looking at what else can cleaner fish do? There's, there's a lot of interest um, and research now going into microbiomes. Microbiomes are the suite of microorganisms that cover every surface, living and non. Well, if you look at your, your skin and you ask, you know, whose cells are these? Most of the cells on your skin are not your own skin cells. They're microorganisms. And you've got microorganisms in your gut, you know, all over. So they play uh, a huge role in all kinds of processes, including behavior. And so, um, and because cleaner fish physically contact hundreds of fish a day, different species, and they're also in contact with the corals, they have the potential to spread lots of microbes. And so we're looking at that. And so here's a, a cartoon of how cleaner fish might influence the, the diversity of microbes uh, on coral reefs by basically connecting everything else in the picture, just like going to a party and the host is, is contacting everybody, all the guests, that host is putting all them in contact with one another by that contact. So that's what you see on the right here. That's what's happening. All right, some, some quick results here. Um, we, we've worked in uh, two study sites. We did experiments where we removed cleaner fish from um, some areas and, and not others. 
And then we looked at the microbiome of damselfish that live around those uh, cleaning stations. And in Puerto Rico, we didn't see any difference. But in St. Croix, we found a big difference uh, in the microbial diversity of damselfish that had, a clean, had cleaner fish present compared with those uh, whose cleaner fish we took away. And don't try to read these graphs. I'll explain them to you. We did experiments in the lab using um, ocean surgeon fish. And some of the ocean surgeon fish we soaked in antibiotics for like five days to strip their microbiome. In other ones, we didn't do that. And then in both groups, some of them were then exposed to cleaner fish and others not. The ones that were exposed to cleaner fish, their microbial diversity increased dramatically over the course of a week, whereas the ones who didn't have cleaner, um, excess of cleaner did not. So the cleaner fish seemed to have a big impact on the microbial diversity of these, of these uh, surgeon fish. If you look at corals, effects on corals around our, this is just for St. Croix, uh, around the coral heads where we had cleaner fish present um, versus absent, the number of visits to those cleaning stations was um, positively correlated with the microbial diversity, especially for diseased corals. So the impact was much greater for diseased corals than for healthy corals. And don't try to read this either, um, this graph. What is, I'm showing you here is that also there were more uh, types of, of, bac of bacteria that were enriched uh, where there were cleaner fish present than where there weren't. There are certain species of bacteria that were really characteristic of a cleaning station that were, that were not, that were, that were rare or absent on non-cleaning stations, suggesting that cleaner fish uh, do have an impact on, on uh, microbial diversity at cleaning stations. All right, so I started my career working on sharks. And then I got into smaller reef fish, mostly damselfish. And then I got into the parasites that feed on those damselfish. And then I got into the microbes uh, on, those da on those fish. And we're also now also working on viruses. That, and so we're getting smaller and smaller and smaller. And the more we get smaller, the more we realize just how important those tiny things are. And so if I can borrow a quote from a Grateful Dead tune, um, a kid thinking for the deadheads in the, in the audience. Once in a while you get shown the light in the strangest places if you look at it right. So when you start looking for these tiny things, you find them and you realize, wow, like they're everywhere and they're super important. All right, so I'd like to uh, thank uh, our sponsors, uh, including See and Learn, for bringing us back this year. And um, the number of people involved in this work is just way too many to list. There, there have been hundreds over the years. Uh, again, Gina Hendrick has been heavily involved in this work, and she's here today, but to list all of them would be virtually impossible unless I had like you know, 20 slides. Um, so uh, we've really benefited from, from all the, the help we've gotten around the world. We work uh, throughout the Caribbean, we work in the Philippines, Australia, South Africa, uh, Hawaii, anywhere there's reefs and parasites, we, we work and we've built teams that are active in all these places. Um, so, we thank all of them, and we thank you for listening. Questions? Yeah? Who provides your funding? Most of it comes from National Science Foundation. And what, what, who provides our funding? That's the question. And the answer is most of our funding comes from the uh, US National Science Foundation. So um, our earlier work was funded by Biological Oceanography Division. And more recently, we've been uh, funded by um, Biodiversity and Systematics Program. Any other countries providing? Uh... Yeah, they provide support on, on their end. So when we go there, they provide some support um, from them. And we, we provided our support with uh, NSF. Um, typically, theirs isn't as much as ours, but they definitely contribute. Yeah. Yeah. If I understood you correctly, you said there's more parasites on reefs that are uh, degraded. Well, at least, at least uh, certain kinds, yeah. Yeah. Okay, so the question was that, that uh, I mentioned that parasites were more abundant on degraded reefs, and I'll qualify that by saying certain, certain kinds of parasites uh, are. 
the general pattern that you see in nature is that a healthy ecosystem has a very high diversity of parasites, but, but no one gets super abundant. So you don't, have, you don't have huge numbers of anything, but you've got a lot of lots of things, or, or lots of things you have a, have a small number of. And when things go, get disrupted, what you end up with with fewer species of parasites, but those that are there go nuts for whatever, for various reasons. So uh, with respect to the nathed isopods, and this also applies to other parasites that have free living stages where they have to find a host by swimming, and they spend a lot of time in the bottom. That includes things like uh, monogenians and even uh, some digenian trematodes. Anything that's got a, a stage where it has to move to get to a host. High, co uh, we have high coral cover, the coral eats all those things. It'll eat monogenian larvae, it'll eat digenian larvae, nathids, whatever. Coral is like, you know, they feed on everything. So high coral eats those stages, which means you have fewer of them that can infect a host. Once you lose the coral, as long as you still have fish hosts, you've got nothing on the bottom that's going to do them any harm. Like uh, all that bottom is prime real estate. It's rubble. They love it. There's nothing there to eat them. And so you get these, these spikes. And again, the pattern we see is dramatic. But what's really interesting is that it only takes about you know, a, a really small amount of coral cover to, to have an effect. You did something with less than 25% coral cover will have a significant impact on the abundance of these parasites. But once you get below that, um, things can get really, really high. So if we want to go catch nathids or monogenines, for example, we know if we find areas where there's lots of fish and very little coral, we'll hit it every time. So, yeah. That answer your question? Yes, sir. Yeah. That's a really good question, and we really haven't looked at that uh, much. So, uh, sorry, the question was seagrass beds. So, so we talked about how degradation of reefs uh, in, impacts the abundance of the parasites. What about sea degradation of seagrass beds? And we really haven't looked at that. That's a really good question, actually. Yeah, we have we've, we've did some sampling out there with our light traps and with fish cages, and we do catch them out there. We've, we've not really quantified uh, how what we collect differs among seagrass beds that are in different conditions. So thanks for the idea. We'll do that. <laughs> yeah. Do we know of anything, or is there anything to be learned about the competition between the parasites? That's also a really good question. So, um, uh, sorry, um, the question is competition among parasites. So is there anything to be learned about competition among parasites? And so internally, that's definitely the case. So internally, you know, parasites have their spot where they like to live. And um, they don't get along well with other ones who want to live in that same space, whether it's in the gut or you know, inside the body cavity, whatever. There's some competition there. For ectoparasites, as long as there's surface area where one can attach, it doesn't matter because they don't. Once they attach, they're stuck there and they can't like move to fend each other off. So, in, so internal parasites, uh, that is the case, but probably not for external parasites. Anything else? Yeah. Um, we dive a lot. So as divers, can we be affected by these parasites? The question is, as divers, can we be affected by these parasites? And the answer is no. So we swim with them all the time. We hold, we handle them, and they, they don't do anything for us. Okay. Yeah. So no worries there. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So they, so it's a double whammy. So they have that big one on them that, it, that from other studies, uh, it's been shown that that creates a significant amount of drag on the fish as it swims. So it's no, it's no shock that they don't make the trip. And yet they're, they're staying put where all the nathids are. So it's likely that they're getting hit pretty hard, you know. And so fortunately for them, those, um, those antelope only last for about a year, and then they die and fall off. But that 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 one year could be pretty pretty rough. Um, so what we haven't done um, is actually quantify that. 
uh, by more the you know the extent to which they get hit more, um, but also how that impacts their longevity. We haven't tracked them long enough to, to really look at that. But aren't they getting some advantage of being still on the reef where they can, where there's a drops off? Yeah, so the question was, um, wouldn't there also be a benefit because the parasites that fall off um, would be eaten? And so uh, that could be true if you have a high coral and lots of coral. Yeah, but when you don't have much coral, you just don't get that. Yeah. And they tend to live right on the edge of the reef not deep in the in the coral, so on the edge of, on the sand reef interface. So they probably don't benefit much from that. All right. Thank you, Tech Man.